Welcome to Stars and Swords. I'm Alistair Stevens. In this episode, we're going to continue our journey through Narnia with chapters 6 through 11 inclusive of C.S. Lewis's The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe. And I know I said at the end of last week's episode that we would make it all the way to chapter 12, but I was just too ambitious. I have already failed in my desire to keep this podcast under 45 minutes, but I will steadfastly hold the line and keep it less than, let's say, 75 We'll see how that works out. Before we get to this week's reading, then, let's circle back around to what turned out to be, surprisingly perhaps, the most controversial element of last week's episode, the Turkish delight. First, I must concede in the spirit of, of empathy and inclusivity at this special time of year, I guess, there are some people who like Turkish delight. I must admit that I don't have a sweet tooth under the best of circumstances, and whatever taste I had for starchy, gummy kinds of confectionery I exhausted when I was very young and would eat jars of jelly babies with my grandfather. I'm realizing now that I don't know exactly how common jelly babies are in other parts of the world, and I know how strange that can sound, so I will add into the show notes some short explanatory material for your edification. So, a brief history. Turkish delight does actually come from Turkey, and for the longest time could not be replicated elsewhere because the techniques involved in making it, and according to some, the quality of the local water, made it difficult to mimic. In 1861, though, enterprising traders began importing it to Britain under the absolutely enchanting name Lumps of Delight. It is a phenomenon, feeding the Victorian desire for both sweets and the exotic. Its popularity endures into the 20th century, when the chocolate manufacturer J.S. Fry and Sons begins to make a chocolate-covered, heavily rose-flavored and gelatinous version for mass consumption. This is important because a lot of the speculation you'll read about Turkish delight in the context of the Chronicles of Narnia, or I guess more specifically in the context of just The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, since oddly Turkish delight doesn't appear in any of the other books. What's important, though, is that Turkish Delight is well established as a sweet shop staple before Lewis even goes to Oxford. And though the expensive, luxurious, authentic, exotic Turkish Delight was still available, and was, as I say, very expensive, the Fry's variety is popular enough that when the famous British chocolate company Cadbury buys J.S. Fry & Sons in 1919, they preserve the Fry's name on the packaging of the Turkish Delight, which implies that it was already popular enough that the brand itself was worth preserving. The popularity of that particular brand of Turkish delight continues through the 20th century. In the late 1970s and the 80s, its popularity peaked again thanks to some adult, ostensibly sexy, and wildly appropriative Arabian Nights-themed commercials. I will add one of those to the show notes, too. What's most interesting about the Turkish delight in the book, though, is how it acts as a lens through which we might better understand so many aspects of this narrative. Let's deal with the superficial aspects first and read the text. This is from chapter 4. Quote, It is dull, son of Adam, to drink without eating, said the queen presently. What would you like best to eat? Turkish delight, please, your majesty, said Edmund. The queen let another drop fall from her bottle onto the snow, and instantly there appeared a round box tied with a green silk ribbon, which, when opened, turned out to contain several pounds of the best Turkish delight. Each piece was sweet and light to the very centre, and Edmund had never tasted anything more delicious. He was quite warm now, and very comfortable. While he was eating, the Queen kept asking him questions. At first Edmund tried to remember that it is rude to speak with one's mouthful, but soon he forgot about this, and thought only of trying to shovel down as much Turkish delight as he could, and the more he ate, the more he wanted to eat, and he never asked himself why the Queen should be so inquisitive. And then we'll skip ahead a little later in the scene, quote, For she knew, though Edmund did not, that this was enchanted Turkish delight, and that anyone who had tasted it would want more and more of it, and would even, if they were allowed, go on eating it till they killed themselves. End quote. The narrative voice, then, gives us no direct insight into why Edmund chooses Turkish delight as his food of choice. When offered anything to eat, and the power of the Queen of Narnia has already been demonstrated by the drink that she gives him, remember, though, that is expressly unfamiliar and not something that Edmund has requested. Nonetheless, we might make a few inferences a priori. We might wonder if Edmund is choosing something familiar or something unfamiliar. The text might support a reading that he is in fact familiar with Turkish delight, and not in an abstract way, but as a direct experience, because of the line, quote, 
each piece was sweet and light to the very center, which implies not only the existence of bad Turkish delight in the world, heavy and claggy and unpleasant, but that Edmund may have had experience of such bad Turkish delight. Otherwise, we might wonder why the narrative voice would draw attention to it. Yes, it was magical Turkish delight, and what's more, it wasn't bad like some Turkish delight is, you know how that goes. If Edmund is familiar with Turkish delight, then it makes more sense that it may be his favorite, or at least a treasured memory, and that his choice is nothing more than personal taste. If we are unconvinced by that reading, we might be tempted to speculate about the exoticism of the drink, prompting an equally exotic response from Edmund. Here is a warming beverage unknown to him, so perhaps he's already thinking of far-flung lands and unknown pleasures. In which case, the iconic power of Turkish delight in the popular imagination might explain his choice. We might be tempted to couple that with the magnificence of the queen, which might elevate his desirous impulse to something more, well, luxurious, more indulgent, which certainly matches the Victorian and Edwardian era concept of these imported lumps of delight. But there again, Fry's Turkish delight was a common treat in every sweet shop in Britain for a generation before the Pevensey children arrived at the professor's house. So we might abstract our interpretation by one level and point instead to the narrative desire for something exotic to contrast with the good, wholesome, middle-class English food served to Lucy by Tumnus. Thus, it isn't Edmund himself who is choosing Turkish delight, but in a sense, the author function, the Lewis within the book who is making that choice in order to make that contrast explicit. Something luxurious where Tumnus' food is simple. Something decadent where Tumnus's food is wholesome. Something, crucially, foreign where Tumnus's food is almost axiomatically English. In this way, the Turkish delight would be an indication to the reader that the witch is not to be trusted, and perhaps even that there is something impure in Edmund's motivation. Certainly, we ought not to be celebrating his, well, gluttony. It remains impossible to say with certainty which of these interpretations is true, though I would argue that all are at least valid, and they are interesting avenues to explore. And this, right here, this confusion, this uncertainty, this is why some readers, even scholars, prefer not to rely on close reading as a discipline. It doesn't always give you answers. It usually leaves you, in fact, rather than certain of what you're supposed to get from the text, with more questions, more things to which we want to pay attention moving forward. I consider that the point of close reading. I consider that the principal advantage and the benefit of our approach here. But I do understand the appeal of the definitive answer. I do understand the appeal of an authoritative answer. There is one approach to the question of the Turkish delight, however, that I do want to challenge, that I want to make sure doesn't take root in our understanding of the text, because while I think it, it springs from a good and generous impulse, it diverts our attention from the text and makes the ending of the story much less powerful, much less effective. Though, in some cases, that is probably by design, because I think that this understanding exists in part to partially strip the story of its Christian allegorical elements. This approach, briefly, casts Edmund as primarily a victim of the Queen's malign influence, a good boy who is led astray for understandable reasons by a malignant force. Now, obviously, that is true to some extent. We saw in the earlier reading how powerfully the Turkish delight compels him, and that it isn't simply that Edmund is a treacherous little glutton that moves him to gorge himself on sweets. But we absolutely have to pay attention to what he does and why, because that is the path to understanding the story's moral aspects. Cara Strickland, in her article Why Was Turkish Delight C.S. Lewis's Guilty Pleasure, the link will be in the show notes, makes an argument that concludes with this thought, quote, For Edmund, Turkish Delight represented a way to taste happier times, when his family was all together and the future was unmarred by world conflict. It's hard to blame him for reaching for the box the witch offers and filling his mouth as quickly as possible to make up for lost time. And that is a lovely piece of writing. That is demonstrative of an admirable human sensitivity. But that is neither what the book tells us nor respectful of the narrative purpose of the scene. Yes, we can't blame him for reaching into the box of sweets after that first time, perhaps. Yes, we can't blame him for being magically compelled to eat more than he ought. But he is already, before he enters Narnia, before he meets the queen, a cruel, duplicitous, selfish little boy. 
We see that when he first arrives through the wardrobe. And the narrator tells us that he is cold and alone and frightened. And his response is to offer a bullying, half-hearted offer of peace to Lucy. More on that, by the way, in a moment. When he returns from Narnia that first time, it isn't the magical influence of the White Witch that makes him lie about the reality of the world beyond the wardrobe. Quite the contrary, in fact. As I mentioned last week, that makes it all the more difficult for him to lure his brother and sisters into the trap which has been laid. In fact, Edmund makes no discernible effort to lure Peter, Lucy, and Susan into Narnia. He does accept that he is already more than half on the side of the witch, and you'll note too how completely he accepts Lucy's word that the queen really is the white witch. He isn't deceiving himself, or building a narrative about being a hero, or even having been wronged. He does not believe that he is a victim. He knows that the queen is evil, knows that he entered her service willingly, and doesn't take further action only because he is too frightened of his sibling's censure. Quote, And now we come to one of the nastiest things in this story. Up to that moment, Edmund had been feeling sick and sulky and annoyed with Lucy for being right, but he hadn't made up his mind what to do. When Peter suddenly asked him the question, he decided all at once to do the meanest and most spiteful thing he could think of. He decided to let Lucy down. The narrator there absolutely setting the bounds of Edmund's moral failing. This is obviously a part of Lewis's desire to be, within the frame of the novel, somewhat morally instructive, but it is also true to Edmund's character and the narrative voice. By offering explanations of his thought process, it doesn't give us the luxury of believing that the White Witch is manipulating him or making him vicious. He really, genuinely, is the worst. And he has to be in order for the final moral turn of the piece to play out appropriately. One last thing before we get into today's reading then, because Marsha, I hope that I'm pronouncing that correctly, sent me a note on Instagram asking about the way that Edmund calls out to Lucy upon his arrival in Narnia, specifically this line from chapter three, where Edmund says, quote, I say, Lou, I'm sorry I didn't believe you. I see now you were right all along. Do come out. Make it Pax. Marsha asks about the use of Pax there, and it is really interesting because it unlocks a whole conversation about the assumptions we can make about these children and in a broader sense, Lewis's dialogue. Pax here is literally the Latin word for peace, as in Pax Romana, the period of 200 years or so at the height of the Roman Empire, when their power was so assured and so dominant that it stabilized the entire Mediterranean region for effectively the first time in history. Edmund is using the word here in a more colloquial schoolboy Latin way to mean a truce, an end to hostilities. This tells us that Edmund has had at least a little education in Latin, which wasn't uncommon by the 1940s, but was certainly a marker of at least a good middle-class education. This is consistent with all of the dialogue in our first reading, in which every character speaks with really a very narrow kind of social tone. Even the queen, who is not as elevated in her language as some monarchs of Narnia will be by the end of this book. And I guess just to mark this, because we will return to it in due course, we should note that in the Queen's first appearance, her own dialogue slips in its formality. When she first talks to Edmund at the end of chapter 3, she correctly applies the majestic plural, the royal we, you shall know us better hereafter, she says. But she can't maintain it. After the chapter break, she drops it, even before she starts affecting a warmer demeanor to try to ensnare Edmund. She says, answer me once and for all or I shall lose my patience. Are you human? She is play-acting the role of the queen, play-acting the use of the majestic plural, but not managing to stick the landing. There is a possible explanation here that she is deliberately choosing to drop the majestic plural when speaking to Edmund because he is a son of Adam and therefore, in some sense within the bounds of Narnia, implicitly royal, but crucially, she drops it first before she realizes that he is a son of Adam. So when we think about this use of language, I think that there are two possible interpretations, which are related, of course. The first is that she is inconsistent because she is simply playing the role of queen. She is an imposter. Or perhaps more subtly, she doesn't consistently use the majestic plural form because, although she does sincerely consider herself to be a queen, the country is not aligned behind her. We'll maybe circle back to that later on when we have a lot more information about kings and queens in the land of Narnia to draw upon. And it's fair to say, in conclusion, that Lewis doesn't really have a strong ear for children's dialogue. The Pevensey children regularly speak as though they are children in the 1920s, the 1910s even, more than the 1940s, with a 
somewhat more sophisticated and somewhat more old-fashioned vocabulary than we might expect. Much of that distinction, I think, has been lost on modern readers, because it can be hard to tell the differences across a 20-year period almost a century ago because it is the nature of history that it tends to blur. This is exacerbated potentially by our understanding that the Pevensey children are bordering on upper middle class and are thus receiving a more traditional and old-fashioned education even in the 1930s and 1940s, this would account for the Latin, than their peers. We'll continue to look at how the children speak and how we navigate that most ubiquitous element of British fiction, social class, as we move forward. But for now, we're further into this podcast than we ought to be, considering that we haven't even started this week's reading, so let me offer you then a summary of what we face beyond the wardrobe. All four of the Pevensey children emerge into the winter forest on the far side of the wardrobe, and Peter immediately apologizes to Lucy for not believing her. They go to Tumnus's cave, only to find that he has been arrested by the White Witch's secret police. They follow a robin and meet Mr. Beaver, who takes them back to his dam and introduces his wife, and then delivers a ton of exposition and prophecy. Edmund slips away and finds himself in a garden of statues and meets with the wolf captain of the secret police. He then tells the White Witch what he has learned of Aslan, and they immediately leave her home. The other children flee with the beavers and take shelter in a cave only to be unexpectedly visited by Father Christmas. No, really, Father Christmas, who naturally enough gives them weapons. They leave en route for the stone table, and we cut back to Edmund and the White Witch, who pause in their journey to petrify an animal tea party. There's a lot to cover, and the snow is already melting, so let's get underway. Interestingly, chapter 6 begins with the first hints of the imminent thaw, with the snow being described as wet before the children even realize what it is. And we should note, too, the lovely formality of Peter's apology to Lucy. Quote, Peter turned at once to Lucy. I apologize for not believing you, he said. I'm sorry. Will you shake hands? Of course, said Lucy, and did. This is an honest, humble, sincere apology. Unlike Edmund's desire to hide his shame, Peter is forthright and treats his youngest sibling with respect and with decency. I would also be loath to skip over Susan's cunning as they begin to explore the forest. Quote, Ah, said Susan, stamping her feet. It's pretty cold. What about putting on some of these coats? They're not ours, said Peter doubtfully. I'm sure nobody would mind, said Susan. It isn't as if we wanted to take them out of the house. We shan't even take them out of the wardrobe. And thank you, dear listener, for joining me in this episode of In Susan's Defense, the show within a show where I try to explain that Susan is clever and good, actually, and not just a wet blanket. In all seriousness, I do understand the common reader response to this. You just arrived in Narnia and your first thought is, ugh. But I would echo, in fact, I would read this as an echo, of the beat in the first chapter in which Susan is seeking to protect and care for her siblings in the role of their absent mother. The fact that Edmund criticizes her for that is an indication that the instinct itself is not bad. Rather, we'll see, including in this very passage, as the Pevensey children first venture into Narnia, that this kind of play, and what we might think of as a kind of adult practice, is a healthy and admirable part of childhood. If you were so inclined, you could see that as the theme of the text, and a means of understanding, metaphorically, what Lewis is doing at the end of this book. In this moment, though, I see a Susan who is once again playing the role of mother, yes, both stepping into her adult responsibility and encouraging her siblings to do the same, and of course, tempering Peter's impetuous desire for adventure with a little care and a little forethought. I read her questions here through this dialogue, what are we to do next, and what about putting on some of these coats, as the kind of gentle prompts a mother might give to encourage some self-reflection and good decision-making from her children rather than the outright complaints that I guess some readers see in the text. And this is not me defending Susan in a vacuum here. This is also echoed later in the kinds of interactions we see between Mrs. and Mr. Beaver. Either way, we can surely agree that her rationale for taking the coats and staying warm is a good one. Peter voices a kind of pure Kantian deontological argument against taking the coats. They are not ours, and by implication, theft is wrong. While Susan adopts a more pragmatic, clever, complex approach. How can we meaningfully take them if, in reality, they aren't even leaving the wardrobe? What, in a sense, is a thing's location? Isn't all property theft? We aren't quite at the point where we will talk in an informed way about 
the gender essentialism that is happening in this book. We're just collecting evidence as we go, but we will continue to keep that in mind. I mentioned the idea of play being invoked in this part of the story too, and we should call some attention to that. Lucy suggests here, wrapped up in their warm fur coats as they are, that, quote, we can pretend we are Arctic explorers, and Peter replies, quote, this is going to be exciting enough without any pretending. What exactly is the excitement to which Peter is referring? As far as he can tell, it's just a snowy forest with night coming on. They haven't even yet decided to go and see Tumnus, and they certainly haven't discovered the action taken against our favorite fawn by the White Witch. This, it seems to me, is an example of the kind of adult practice I mentioned earlier. Narnia, Peter seems to understand, is a place where, among other things, the children can adopt their adult roles. We don't need to pretend, he says, because being here is already a kind of pretending. And we should note that, in a sense, this is what fantasy fiction is for. What all fiction is for, we might argue, but particularly and relevantly fantasy fiction. The entering into an unknown land makes possible the consolation, recovery, and escape proposed by Professor Tolkien, sorry, no jar this week, in On Fairy Stories. It's metaphorized here as the actual transit into another world. This is, we might speculate, the key appeal of portal fantasy as a subgenre. Yes, it is a functional narrative means of exploring a new environment with characters who are at least broadly familiar to the reader and unfamiliar with the world beyond the wardrobe, but surely portal fantasies work in part because they are themselves reflective of the magical portal that is a book. We enter into the Chronicles of Narnia in much the way that the Pevensey children enter into Narnia itself, and like them, we can explore other lives, other possibilities. We can become more ourselves than we were before. We don't have to pretend to be a reader because we are reading. Peter doesn't have to pretend to be an explorer because he, thanks to the magic of the portal, has become an explorer. We are that which we seem to be, and being and seeming will be a major theme as we move forward through this week's reading. All that said, let's skip ahead to Tumnus's home. Quote, The former occupant of these premises, the fawn, Tumnus, is under arrest and awaiting his trial on a charge of high treason against her imperial majesty Jadis, queen of Narnia, chatelaine of Caer Paravel, empress of the Lone Islands, etc., also of comforting her said majesty's enemies, harboring spies, and fraternizing with humans. Signed, Morgrim, captain of the secret police, long live the queen. So, we have a plot. Let's do some close reading and some etymology, shall we? Firstly, I'm indebted to Karina on the Stars and Swords Discord, thank you, Karina, for reminding me that I hadn't talked about the origin of Tumnus's name. So, this seems like as good a time as any. There are several theories about the origin of that name, but the most compelling to me, given both the subject and Lewis's predilection for Latin, for his classics, is that Tumnus is named for Vertumnus, the Roman god of the seasons, of change, of gardens, and of fruit trees. That seems at least to be appropriate. Jadis is often taken as the Turkish word for witch, which would be pronounced closer to Jude. But in Paul Ford's revised and expanded Companion to Narnia, the link will be in the show notes, it's an interesting glossary and a recommended accompaniment to the serious Narnia scholar, I would say. He cites a reference inside of a Lewis letter from October 1916 to a character in an unfinished Lewis poem called Juan Jadis. Juan there meaning pallid or pale or feeble. This, in turn, seems to have been informed by Lewis's reading of a 15th century Middle French poem, Ballade des Dômes du Temps Jadis, Jadis here meaning of times past in the French. The poem is literally a ballad of the ladies of times gone by. So the name is attested in Lewis's body of work long, long before Narnia. But obviously, we can't ignore the replicated use of the Turkish language in the Narnian naming convention, specifically Aslan, the great king of beasts, is of course the Turkish word for lion. There's an enviable literalism there. The Queen's titles tell us something about the structure of this land, too. Imperial Majesty suggests the subjugation of several countries under the authority of one. Following this with Queen of Narnia establishes that Narnia is the seat of her power, as we might think, but also confirms Lucy's earlier implication that Narnia is a country and not, for example, a continent or a world. Chatelaine is the feminine form of the French word for a governor of a castle, a kind of 
military commander occupying the lowest level of a feudal hierarchy. That is, someone who exerts a military presence over a local area under the command of a count, but who is not a member of the nobility or the aristocracy themselves. Ker Paravel, as a name, is particularly interesting because it doesn't borrow from Latin or from Old French, but rather from Old English. Caer, or care, spelled with an A-E, means court, and Paravel, with an A-I-L ending, means lower or lesser. Ker Paravel, the lesser court, has already been introduced to us by Tumnus. We are told that Narnia extends from the lamppost to, quote, Ker Paravel on the Eastern Sea. Tumnus also mentions the existence of four thrones at Ker Paravel when he is fretting about what the White Witch will do to him. More on that shortly. So holding the title of Chatelaine of Ker Paravel tells us that it is not the seat of Jadis's power, but further implies that it has a purpose that is separate from her, though she does certainly hold the keys. We might speculate about the nature of that purpose, but the name certainly implies a subordination to a greater court, or a greater power, more on that, too, later. Empress of the Lone Islands doesn't tell us a great deal, except, of course, that it speaks to mid-century imperialism and the domination of distant, scattered islands by a singular authority. And lastly, we will get to the name of the captain of the Queen's secret police. And therein lies an interesting tale. The original British publication of the novel, and most likely the book that you are reading along with this podcast, uses the name Maugrim which might be derived from the French malgré, meaning evil aspect or grace, or, according to some sources, might be derived from some combination of maw, morgue, and grim. When Lewis edited the novel for American publication, however, the name of the wolf was changed to Fenris Ulf, an anglicization of Fenris Ulfre, a child of the trickster god Loki in the Norse poetic Edda. And, it needs to be emphasized, just a huge wolf. Now, of course, there isn't anything particularly relevant to either Norse mythology or, fairly, the stories of medieval France in the use of a wolf as a secondary antagonist in this story. Rather, we're seeing here the first real manifestation of Lewis's third instinct as a writer. If his first instinct is to evoke the standard tropes of fantasy and fairy tale, castles and witches and swords and prophecies and ancient forests and things like that, and the second is to synthesize those elements with icons of the Greco-Roman world, with fauns and nymphs and the like, particularly if we extend the definition of Greco-Roman world to include the Eastern Roman Empire, which becomes the Byzantine Empire based in Constantinople in Turkey, now famously Istanbul. If we take the broadest and most inclusive definition of that Greco-Roman classical world from the Greek Dark Ages ending in 800 BC to the mid-15th century and the fall of Constantinople to the Ottomans, then we get a solid account of Lewis's second creative instinct, which we might consider classicalism. Medievalism first, classicalism second, and third, well, the third instinct is best represented by Beatrix Potter's talking animal stories. We're about to get, in this week's reading, a lot of animals, and it may well be argued that Tumnus fits companionably alongside the talking animal characters too. Right after this, we will meet the robin, who is not capable of speech, but is certainly capable of agency and is both a symbol of the returning spring. Quote, Wherever the robin alighted, a little shower of snow would fall off the branch. Presently the clouds parted overhead, and the winter sun came out, and the snow all around them grew dazzlingly bright. End quote. The robin is an example of the kind of Beatrix Potter-approved good animals, capital G, capital A, that we'll need to have in mind when we meet the beavers in the next chapter. Peter says right here, quote, They're good birds in all the stories I've ever read. I'm sure a robin wouldn't be on the wrong side. End quote. And it's not even quite that simple, honestly, because the robin isn't just good, but is in some intentional, causal, or cosmological way allied with the children. It leads them through the forest, not just to Mr. Beaver, but specifically to the spot that Tumnus told Mr. Beaver to meet the children at should something happen to him. We might think here of the knocking of the thrush at the secret entrance to the Lonely Mountain at sunset of Durin's Day in The Hobbit. Long prophesied, but also in the moment, not magical. This suggests to my mind three possibilities, I think, that the robin is conscious, and is deliberately leading the children to Mr. Beaver, either on its own or following the instructions of another being, possibly Tumnus, possibly some different creature. The second possibility is that the robin is not conscious, but that its movement through the wood 
was somehow foreseen or was arranged by Tumnus in order to lead the children upon their return to Narnia. The third option, and perhaps the most compelling option, is that the Robin is not conscious and is not leading the children deliberately, but that the world is, at a deeper cosmological or theological level, ordered in such a way that these circumstances align to the benefit of the good. In this instance, that means that Aslan is moving in the world, which means that the spring is coming to an end, which means that the first birds of spring, including robins, are venturing out into the melting snow. This echoes, of course, Professor Tolkien's understanding of eucatastrophe, that because the world is created by a benevolent god, the systems underpinning that world are fundamentally benevolent too. We'll have the opportunity to think about the power of prophecy and what that prophecy tells us about the nature of the world in the next chapter. We can also note throughout today's reading that we keep returning to Edmund's preoccupation with food. We will be told later that this is a direct consequence of having eaten the Turkish delight, that the memory of that Turkish delight and the magic of that Turkish delight has, of course, removed all taste and appetite for Edmund for anything but that Turkish delight. This is not just Edmund, a greedy child, but this is Edmund falling deeper and deeper under the influence of the White Witch right before our eyes. And one last detail from the notice that we find in Tumnus's house. The use of the phrase secret police is, of course, chilling. And it sketches an interesting kind of political reality for the residents of Narnia. The queen is in power, and there is no open dissent against her rule, no domestic rebellion. Otherwise, she would be employing an army, much as she does later, not a police force. This, of course, would make contemporary readers think of the Gestapo, of the authoritarian Nazi rule over Germany, and would work as a powerful shorthand to suggest the stakes. Note that although Tumnus is allegedly being taken to trial, there is no evidence that such a trial ever takes place. The idea of state-sanctioned militarism, of violence and of deceit and of fear-mongering targeted at the Queen's own people isn't just upsetting on the surface level, particularly to those mid-century contemporary readers, but it is also a betrayal of the fundamental principle of the feudal system, where the loyalty and service of the lower class is met with equal loyalty and service from the ruler. The presence of the secret police also goes some distance to papering over a very real crack, I think, in Lewis's imaginary world, which is this. Everything is so small. Judging from the travel times given to us at the beginning of the story and the map drawn by Lewis, Narnia is maybe 60 miles wide. That means that the entirety of this country, more or less, is maybe charitably, generously, five and a half thousand square miles. That's the size of Connecticut. For our international friends, that's about the size of Brunei or about half of Jamaica or about double the size of Hong Kong. For our Middle Earth friends, that's a little less than a third of the area of the Shire. I would need to take more careful notes, but there are maybe 20 named characters in this book, four of whom are employed in the professor's house, and by the end of this week's reading, we have met all but one of them. And this, to be clear, is not a condemnation of Lewis's story, but it demonstrates how completely this story, how completely Narnia, operates as a fairy tale and not as a modern post-Tolkienian fantasy novel. This is a scale that's just a little larger than Red Riding Hood, a scale in the order of Sleeping Beauty. And it's not just about the size, of course, but also about its rigor. Where does Tumnus get his packages? We might speculate that he trades with the beavers for food, but where did the sardines come from for Lucy's toast? Sardines are a saltwater fish. How does the White Witch maintain control over Narnia if her only companions are an unnamed dwarf and Mogrim the wolf? Well, that last question, I guess, does have an operative answer, and it's the answer introduced here. The secret police, the tool of the authoritarian, the means of subverting a population against itself, of making everyone, to some extent, first complicit in the policing of the population and then in the service of the government. Fear, as a tool, has done, is continuing to do, terrible things. We can only speculate what the White Witch would do with a 24-hour news channel at her command. From there, let's move into chapter 7. The second of the six chapters we're supposed to be studying this week, my time management skills are paying off beautifully. We must, of course, talk about the beavers. First, a confession. 
I don't share whatever sense of wonder Lewis has when it comes to talking animals. I don't like talking animals. I don't find them magical or enchanting or adorable. This may be my Tolkienian bias, I'm afraid. It makes me want more developed non-human races and characters, or perhaps my anti-talking animal bias makes me more receptive to Tolkien's kind of world building. I'm not sure which comes first in that particular causal chain. But this story is not that story, and we must strive to meet Mr. Beaver here on his own terms, and luckily, those terms are pretty good. I should note right here, one of my favorite lines in this week's reading, definitely the best joke that Peter makes in the book. Quote, Are you the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve? It said. We're some of them, said Peter. <laughs> Peter, proving again that if the Pevensey kids were the X-Men, he would be Cyclops. <laughs> Dear listener, in fact, please come join the Discord so that we can have that discussion. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Susan is Jean Grey, obviously, right? Edmund is roguish, so a Wolverine, perhaps, a Gambit. Lucy is our POV character, so obviously, perhaps, Kitty Pride, which raises the very important question, why doesn't, and really, this might be the most important question we have in our coverage of this entire book, why doesn't Lucy have a little dragon sidekick? Let's move on. We're going to note that Mr. Beaver tells the children that though most of the trees are on their side, there are some that may betray them. This echoes Lucy's assertion earlier in the book that many or all of the categories of creatures in Narnia are capable of being good or evil, of following the White Witch or rejecting her. Creatures are not, it seems, in Lewis's concept of the world, good or evil by dint of nature, but rather by inclination and choice. Let's move forward to the next major turning point of the story, and perhaps the most significant turning point thus far in our understanding of the book, Mr. Beaver's revelation about Aslan. Quote, They say Aslan is on the move, perhaps has already landed. And now a very curious thing happened. None of the children knew who Aslan was any more than you do. But the moment the beaver had spoken those words, everyone felt quite different. Perhaps it has sometimes happened to you in a dream that someone says something which you don't understand, but in the dream it feels as if it has some enormous meaning, either a terrifying one that turns the whole dream into a nightmare, or else a lovely meaning, too lovely to put into words, which makes the dream so beautiful that you remember it all your life and are always wishing you could get into that dream again. It was like that now. At the name of Aslan, each one of the children felt something jump in his inside. Edmund felt a sensation of mysterious horror. Peter felt suddenly brave and adventurous. Susan felt as if some delicious smell or some delightful strain of music had just floated by her. And Lucy got the feeling that you have when you wake up in the morning and realize that it is the beginning of the holidays or the beginning of summer. End quote. So let's take all of this at face value first. Aslan is on the move and may already be in Narnia. That working backwards through today's reading, explains why the spring is already coming. It explains why the winter is already thawing. What's most important, though, is that the name of Aslan triggers a response in each child because, in some sense, the name Aslan is already known to them. This takes us into the philosophical study of epistemology, that is, the philosophy of knowledge itself. In an effort not to make this podcast three hours long, let's move through this fairly quickly. I will note here that in the same way that I am not a Christian, I am profoundly not a Christian epistemologist, uh, which is its own distinct area of study. I am coming at this much more from a general philosophy undergrad kind of direction. So in basic epistemology, that which we consider knowledge is defined as justified true belief. That is to say that in order for us to know something, it has to be true. We can't know something that is untrue. We can just believe it. We also have to believe it, so we can't know something that we don't think is really true. Thirdly, our true belief ought to be justified, otherwise we're guessing. That is to say that on Christmas morning, you might believe that the wrapped package under the tree contains a new pair of winter gloves, and it does contain a new pair of winter gloves. That's belief and truth. But unless you have a justified reason for believing that it's true, rather than just a lucky guess, then you don't have knowledge in the philosophical sense. You might believe that there are aliens out there in the universe, and there may in fact be aliens out there in the universe, but until you have proof, then your belief is not justified. It is not technically knowledge. On top of this, just to complicate things still further, there are three kinds of knowledge. There's propositional or declarative knowledge, often presented as, quote, knowing that, unquote, in the sense that 
I know that coffee originally grew in the great forests on the Ethiopian plateau in prehistoric times. There's procedural knowledge, that is to say, the knowing how, knowing technique, knowing skill, in the sense that I know how to make an excellent cup of coffee. Thirdly, there is knowing by acquaintance or knowing by experiential knowledge. That is to say, having direct contact with a thing and learning from that thing, in the sense that I know that the coffee I have here on my desk is cold. So we have propositional knowledge, knowing that, quote unquote, something is true. We have procedural knowledge, knowing how to do something. And we have experiential knowledge, or knowing by acquaintance, which is having direct knowledge, personal knowledge and experience of something. But Christian epistemology admits a fourth category of knowledge, and it shortcuts the normal criteria that we need to verify or to validate that knowledge. That is, it shortcuts the notion of justified true belief. This is revelatory knowledge. That is, knowledge which is revealed to the individual by, or sometimes mechanically on behalf of, God. This knowledge is, to the Christian mind, axiomatically true. It is, to the recipient of the revelation, believed, it is, because of the method of the communication, inherently justified. That is, I could only believe this because God himself communicated it to me, which means that it must be true because God would not communicate something untrue, which is often tautologically defined because that which God knows is true and that which is true God knows. That's the mechanic of omniscience. To cut this very long discussion short, though, what we're seeing here in the children simply is revelation. It is interesting that the mechanic of that revelation is not the heard voice of God, but rather the name Aslan itself, which seems to carry semantic components that go beyond its simple denotative or conceptual meaning, which is really all we have to go on right now. Superficially, the word Aslan doesn't tell us anything of significance about the being of Aslan, except to the extent that there is a being and it is called Aslan. But despite that, there are additional categories of meaning now experienced by the children. I'm not going to segue here into a long discussion of linguistics, one of my other passions when I was an undergrad. So instead, we will move on to look at what actually happens to the children and what we learn. Because this is one of my favorite things that Lewis does in the entire book. Here are four responses to a moment of revelation. Each is indicative of character, but also combined they tell you enough about the thing that is being revealed that you too, dear reader, experience a similar kind of response to the characters in the story. It makes you feel that the name really is magical, which draws you further into the world. As a means of introducing the most virtuous and noble character in the story, it is a masterstroke. I genuinely think that one of the reasons why even people who dislike the Chronicles of Narnia don't have a lot of criticism for Aslan is this revelation. The story slips him in under our defenses by having us empathetically echo the characters we already like, or in the case of Edmund, dislike. It is, I genuinely think, nothing short of genius. So let's take a look at these responses. Edmund feels a sensation of mysterious horror. So superficially, of course, he is afraid, but the word mysterious here is not simple. It relates to the tradition of mystery in the same way and from the same derivation as the word mystical. It means connected with spiritual or religious truth. This is not allegorical interpretation based on what we may or may not know about Aslan, by the way, but is right there in the text. It's interesting, too, that the word horror in the original Latin was connected with fear primarily, yes, but also with a sense of religious awe. So it is possible to read quite literally right there in the text Edmund's response as being one of simple fear of retribution or discovery, which tracks, of course, to his earlier cowardice, but it is also possible to read it as a kind of religious wonder. What does this tell us about Aslan? That without knowing how or why Edmund recognizes his authority, his ability to judge and punish, his implied moral superiority? Peter feels, quote, suddenly brave and adventurous. This is the affirmation of Peter's role as hero, as leader, in a broader sense, as both man and king. His courage is opposed with Edmund's fear, Edmund's cowardice, certainly, but where Edmund is awed by the name Aslan, Peter is empowered by it. His intrepidity comes to the fore, which no doubt brings us to thoughts of authority and who is given agency and license to take action. This tells us that Aslan is heroic, is active, and is, given the age of the intended reader and the 
boy's own adventure kind of tone that often surrounds Peter, that Aslan is fun. He's a hero. He's going to go on adventures, and we get to go on adventures too because of his power. Susan feels, quote, as if some delicious smell or some delightful strain of music had just floated by her. Ah, Susan the sensualist, the one connected to beauty and gentleness and pleasure. There is something, of course, domestic and curated about her experience of Aslan's name, which speaks to her role as a mother figure, but also speaks to Aslan's beauty and comfort and generosity, provision. And Lucy got the feeling that you have when you wake up in the morning and realize that it is the beginning of the holidays or the beginning of summer. There's some interesting close reading to be done here because of this deft rhetorical trick of describing a feeling by invoking a different but obviously connected feeling. That is, the line could have read, quote, Lucy felt that she were waking in the morning and realizing it was the beginning of the holidays. But instead, we pull the author function trick of relocating that feeling from Lucy into the hearts and minds of the reader. Lucy feels the way you feel, dear reader. This emphasizes Lucy's delight and hope and childishness, her response to Aslan. But the narrative technique here co-situates the reader with Lucy, inviting you to feel what she feels and to associate yourself with Lucy, the nominal protagonist, at least, of this text. We may also see this as a means of emphasizing which of the responses to Aslan and which of the aspects of Aslan is the most important. Yes, per Edmund, Aslan is terrible and magnificent and judgmental. Per Peter, he is brave and intrepid. Per Susan, he is gentle and generous. But mostly, he's about hope. He's about the lightening of the heart. Let's move on. We go to the beaver's house, where we get the same kind of narrative detail that we originally got from Tumnus, but quirked just so. Their civility and comfort is emphasized, making the children feel safe, even though they are in unfamiliar surroundings. Large-scale unfamiliar, though, of course, in the fine details, there is much even in the beaver's home, which is extremely familiar to mid-century readers. The difference comes in the contrast with Tumnus's home, however because the beavers do not live in a middle-class kind of comfort with books and paintings and gentility. There is something rough and rustic and working class here. Mr. Beaver drinks beer. The children eat large amounts of simple rustic food, potatoes and fish and marmalade roll, rather than the more refined tasting menu of toast and sugar cakes that Tumnus served to Lucy. A quick note at the end of this chapter. As Mr. Beaver lights his pipe and foreshadows the ton of exposition that we will get in the next chapter, he notes that it's snowing again, and that the snow will protect them, because they won't have any visitors, and if anyone was trying to follow the children, then, quote, he won't find any tracks, end quote. The masculine pronoun right there is interesting, because we might otherwise be thinking of the queen, but are instead reoriented to think of Mogrim. More importantly, though, we will note that the snow itself is good, that the winter is not a tool of the White Witch. We might be afraid that the trees have turned against the side of good, that some trees at least have turned against the side of good, but there's no notion that the winter itself, a part of the natural world and the progression of things, is evil. It is the symbol of the White Witch, but it is not under her power. Into chapter 8, then. What happened after dinner? Okay, deep breath. We're going to talk about the old rhymes that Mr. Beaver cites in this chapter, and there is an elephant in the Beaver's Lodge that we have to acknowledge. These poems are not very good. They are juvenile, and they don't rhyme very well, and their rhythm is forced, and their focus is poor. And I know that poetry in books like this, he said, eyeing the copy of The Lord of the Rings he always keeps within reach, I know that poetry in books like this is divisive anyway, but this at least has the merit of being extremely short and extremely easy to parse, at least in a superficial literal sense. But the consequence of being short and readily transparent is that there isn't much here, and what is here isn't very good. Quote, Wrong will be right when Aslan comes in sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bears his teeth, winter meets its death. And when he shakes his mane, we shall have spring again. When Adam's flesh and Adam's bone sits at Ker Paravel and throne, the evil time will be over and done. So it's shaky. Wrong will be right is particularly egregious because that could easily be the first line of an evil prophecy, by the way. When Aslan comes in sight, wrong will be right, evil will be good, sour will be sweet, we will all shop at Hot Topic. The reference to the sound of his roar is also less 
developed, less sophisticated than we might like, because we've already seen what happens at the sound of his name. Anchoring Aslan's presence in his bestial roar is doing something else. It is making it more combative. These combined stanzas in Narnia scholarship are referred to as the Golden Age prophecy, though Mr. Beaver definitely describes them as coming from different poems and makes reference to a third different poem in this same section. We don't know much about where they come from. We might infer that Tumnus knows them or knows a version of them because of his reference to the four thrones at Caer Paravel, the which obviously is aware of the prophecy because she's acting against the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve, though you'll note that the use of daughters of Eve, a phrase which does not appear in this poem, suggests that she knows a different version of the prophecy. Let's cover that third version that Mr. Beaver gives us, this one in prose rather than poetry. Quote, Down at Care Paravel, that's the castle on the sea coast down at the mouth of this river which ought to be the capital of the whole country if all was as it should be. Down at Care Paravel, there are four thrones. And it's a saying in Narnia, time out of mind, that when two sons of Adam and two daughters of Eve sit in those four thrones, then it will be the end, not only of the white witch's reign, but of her life. And that is why we have to be so cautious as we came along, for if she knew about you four, your lives wouldn't be worth a shake of my whiskers. So, okay, the poetry is lacking, but let's take a step back and look at this in the abstract. What is the purpose of the prophecy? What does it do? What is the consequence of this strategy of the author function? Well, there are two consequences, I would argue, of this prophecy, both pretty consistent with what we expect from fantasy fiction to give a moment of acknowledgement to the theory of, of genre convention. <laughs> the first and the most straightforward consequence is that it authorially sets the expectation of the reader for the rest of the book. We align the Pevensey children and Aslan in purpose, making us certain that they are on the same side and setting the stakes. Oh my god, if the children make it to Care Paravel and are throned, how exciting will that be? Then the evil time will be over and done? Well, we want that, right? It'll be awesome. The greater function of the prophecy, though, I would argue, is to empower and appoint the children as a special category of being within Narnia. They will go to Kir Paravel and become kings and queens of Narnia because the prophecy said that it would happen. Are they worthy of this? Is it right that these newcomers to our land be crowned, be given authority over the other residents of Narnia? Well, yes, of course, it's in the prophecy. The prophecy means that we don't have to worry about these questions. So yes, ultimately... The prophecy is kind of a shrug in both senses, though we should acknowledge that much like the implicit prophecy of the robin in the forest, we are clearly now dealing with a cosmology that naturally and inevitably bends toward the good. Evil will be undone. Good will win out when Aslan comes in sight, when he bears his teeth, when Adam's flesh and Adam's bone. These things will happen, and when they do, the forces of good will win in a way that is categorical. Thus, we see that the function of prophecy between the time of its first appearance and its fulfillment, that is, between the time that the prophecy appears diegetically in Narnia and this point at which we are moving into the endgame as we are approaching Care Paravel, its purpose in those intervening years is to give hope, to give solace, to give, in some sense, certainty. These things will happen. The winter will end. Evil will be vanquished. You just have to believe. One more quote from this section. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. This is one of the most important aspects of the book, and certainly of the characterization of Aslan himself. He is the king of beasts. He is the son of the emperor beyond the sea. He is good, but he is not safe. Consider this. In light of the emphasis that we have put on safety, on comfort in the story so far, the professor's house is safe. It is distant from London and from nightly bombing raids. Tumnus's house is safe. It is cozy and comfortable and middle class. The beaver's house is safe. It is earthy. It is well provisioned. At every turn, we have deliberately connected notions of goodness and safety, as perhaps we ought in the pages of a children's book, which means that this isn't just a nice rhetorical distinction. It is something fundamentally more important. It is a setting apart of Aslan from the frame of 
not just the children's domestic, earthly, or Narnianly experience, but of Narnia too. Aslan is different. As marvelous and as magical as Narnia is, Aslan is not of this place. We saw some aspect of that when we studied the ways in which hearing Aslan's name affects the children. He is awesome in both senses. And this, this is exactly the point at which a Christian reading of the text will urge us to pull out scripture and start indicating the ways in which Aslan is coterminous with Jesus Christ. But we are going to resist that urge. We are going to resist the urge to start making comparisons and stop reading the book. We have some sense now in what way Aslan might be good but not safe, but we are going to look more carefully at what that might actually mean in the pages to come. By which I mean in next week's reading, I guess. How is Aslan not safe? Okay, one additional indulgence here that is part etymology, part theology. Is it possible that there's a word game happening here right in front of us, that the word safe is being used in two ways to suggest physical protection from adversity and by implication, the salvation of the soul? That is, is Mr. Beaver suggesting that Aslan is not safe because Aslan is the one who saves? Well, more from the text coming up next week when we finally meet this lion. Let's conclude our time here with the beavers then, talking a little about, well, what makes humans human, I guess. Quote, that's why she's bad all through, Mr. Beaver, said Mrs. Beaver. True enough, Mrs. Beaver, replied he. There may be two views about humans, meaning no offense to the present company, but there's no two views about things that look like humans and aren't. I've known good dwarves, said Mrs. Beaver. So have I, now you come to mention it, said her husband, but precious few, and they were the ones least like men. But in general, take my advice. When you meet anything that's going to be human and isn't yet, or used to be human once and isn't now, or ought to be human and isn't, you keep your eyes on it and feel for your hatchet. First, we must acknowledge the gender dynamics at play throughout this entire sequence. Mrs. Beaver is more wise and considered and complex and subtle and nuanced than her husband. She is the one who offers complexity. She is the one that offers nuance. She is the one that offers gently correction. And he is the one who takes that correction and emphasizes the underlying point. They work beautifully together, and we might see aspects of Lewis's gender essentialism at play here with the Beavers. More on that, too, next week. Secondly, I mean, this is just a hell of a passage, and I have a feeling that it's going to be one that I return to at the beginning of next week's session, because that's how I am going to be able to explore it more fully, I suppose, and also explore the responses that I hope I get from you. Let's observe first the shape of this proposition. First, humans are not necessarily good. There are, as implied, two views about humans. We might speculate on the nature of that distinction, particularly as informed by Christian theology, but we are going to restrain ourselves until we have a better sense of what goodness is in the human heart, according to the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Second, dwarves are also not necessarily good, but also not necessarily evil, which is consistent with what we've discussed in the past per Lucy. However, dwarves can be evil, and the less like a human a dwarf might look, the more likely they are to be good. So it isn't that humans are bad, so the closer you get to looking like a human, the more likely you are to be bad. It's that humans might be good or bad, and that is irrelevant to the nature of the creature which looks like a human, which is always bad. Mr. Beaver asserts that this status can change. Anything that's going to be a human but isn't yet, or used to be and isn't now, what, we might ask, are the things which are going to be, or used to be, human? Why are they bad? And that's without touching on perhaps the most evocative category that Mr. Beaver offers us, what ought to be human and isn't. The book here seems to be anticipating the description of the uncanny valley, first postulated by Japanese robotics professor Masahiro Mori in 1970. This theory tells us that we, as human beings, are comfortable with things that are human and things which are inhuman. But there is a degree of human-likeness, of almost but not quite physical humanity that makes us extremely uncomfortable. There are numerous explanations that have been offered through the years for this phenomenon, many of which are anchored in a kind of evolutionary biology, positing that our discomfort is a deep-seated mechanism to make us avoid the sick or the disabled, or those that would be unsuitable reproductive mates. Some have suggested that it's simply the increased cognitive burden that makes us uncomfortable, that is literally our brain taking longer to process what is a human or is not a human and filter and categorize the thing that we're seeing, that it is that processing time which feels unpleasant. 
fantasy and science fiction authors have used that phenomenon to interrogate our discomfort about things which appear human but are not, from vampires to aliens to werewolves to robots. In Narnia, we must remember, being non-human does not necessarily mean that you are evil. The White Witch Jadis, half a djinn and half a giant, as we are told here, is in fact the only entity that is by implication bad because of her nature. And even then, she is only innately bad according to the beavers, though we can't open that can of worms, honestly. So let's approach this from the other direction and ask, what is the nature of being human in the land of Narnia? Well, here too, we don't have a lot of definitive information, except to say that being a human being is absolutely a special category of existence. That is to say, there are no sons of Adam or daughters of Eve in Narnia until the Pevensey children enter, though we can say with some measure of confidence that humans are known in Narnia, as Tumnus recognizes Lucy as a human. And interestingly, if you turn back to chapter two, you will notice that when he says human, he says it with a capital H in the text, and Lucy replies with a lowercase h, which is indicative of exactly this kind of inherent specialness that I'm talking about. Are you a human, capital H? Since our only specific counterexample, that is, the only being in Narnia who looks human but isn't, is the White Witch herself, we kind of have to put a pin in this question until we see more of her in action and more of our heroes in action too. Speaking of which, it is time to skip ahead. This podcast is running extremely long. The children and the beavers realize that Edmund has vanished, and I love how the book handles this division in the narrative, with the children speculating about when he left and how much he heard. Then when we cut ahead to the new chapter, we see exactly when he left and why. Masterful work. Edmund approaches the White Witch's fairy tale castle between the two hills as we start chapter nine, an hour north of the beaver's lodge. Again, Narnia's real small. And if we weren't already somewhat consumed with thoughts of the uncanny valley and the philosophical and spiritual and cognitive gulf between being and seeming, well, hey, here's a whole garden of statues, including a lion. Quote, And he stood there gloating over the stone lion, and presently he did something very silly and childish. He took a stump of lead pencil out of his pocket and scribbled a mustache on the lion's upper lip, and then a pair of spectacles on its eyes. Then he said, Yeah, silly old Aslan, how do you like being a stone? You thought yourself mighty fine, didn't you? But in spite of the scribbles on it, the face of the great stone beast still looked so terrible, and sad, and noble, staring up in the moonlight, that Edmund didn't really get any fun out of jeering at it. He turned away and began to cross the courtyard. That lion will return later, but for now, well, we seem to be engaged in the same kind of philosophical distinction that Mr. Beaver was making. This seems to be Aslan, but is not. In fact, crucially, it is not Aslan in two unique ways. The first is, obviously, that it is a statue. And the second is that it is not Aslan, it is a different lion. It appears the same, but it is emphatically not of the same order of beings as Aslan himself. There are lions, and then there is Aslan. There are things that look human, and then there are humans. Edmund's reunification with the White Witch goes, well, very much as expected. We don't get a lot of new information here. We don't really move the needle on our understanding of Narnia as a place, or Edmund's role within it, or even, honestly, Jadis's role within it either. So we are going to skip all the way ahead to chapter 10, because we have to wrestle with one of the most implausible and divisive things in this entire book. We have to wrestle with the appearance of another sled. Quote, it was a sledge, and it was reindeer with bells on their harness. But they were far bigger than the witch's reindeer, and they were not white, but brown. And on the sledge sat a person whom everyone knew the moment they set eyes on him. He was a huge man in a bright red robe, bright as holly berries, with a hood that had fur inside it and a great white beard that fell like a foamy waterfall over his chest. Everyone knew him, because, though you see people of his sort only in Narnia, you see pictures of them and hear them talked about even in our world, the world on this side of the wardrobe door. But when you really see them in Narnia, it is rather different. Some of the pictures of Father Christmas in our world make him look only funny and jolly, but now that the children actually stood looking at him, they didn't find it quite like that. He was so big and so glad and so real that they all became quite still. They felt very glad, but also solemn. I have come at last, said he. She has kept me out for a long time, but I have got in at last. Aslan is on the move. The witch's magic is weakening. 
So let's start with an important observation. Note how distant the narrative voice is from the children's perspective through this section. The narrative voice is not talking to the Pevensey children or even talking about the Pevensey children, not really. The narrative voice is talking to you, dear reader. The narrative voice is talking about your experience of Father Christmas in the real world and how mediated that is. Really, this passage is indicating the value of fantasy fiction. It is showing you that by stepping into the imaginary boots of young Lucy, we can apprehend Father Christmas, the real Father Christmas, not merely the shadow on the cave wall of our own experience, but the real, vivid, magnificent, almost too magnificent Father Christmas. We get that pleasure, we get that experience through the mediation of fantasy fiction. And it's certainly tempting to look at that description. Some of the pictures of Father Christmas in our world make him look only funny and jolly, but now that the children actually stood looking at him, well, this is being and seeming again, isn't it? This is the difference between the representation of the thing and the actuality of the thing and the intensity and grandeur of that actuality. We should acknowledge an important question. Is it Christmas? Christmas is known to the residents of Narnia, and we can see from the next chapter, we can honestly see from the subtle clues in all of today's reading, that the winter is waning. The spring is already here. Christmas has passed. Father Christmas is overdue, not least of all because he hasn't been present in Narnia through the long winter of the witch's influence. That doesn't mean that Christmas has arrived now, but it also doesn't mean that it hasn't. Father Christmas is going to give gifts in the next chapter. We are going to see the many very woodland creatures, the the fox and the fawns and the squirrels, having something that is awfully close to the Christmas dinner of English tradition. But at the same time, Father Christmas is the only person in the book to say Merry Christmas, to offer any recognition of the holiday. It's absolutely unclear. It actively resists our interpretation. And that is kind of the point of this scene. What on earth, what in Narnia is Father Christmas doing in this book? He's a completely different myth from a completely different and notably much more modern tradition. Though he wasn't, as is often asserted on the internet, invented by the Coca-Cola company, the gift-giving, jolly, huge, bearded, red-robed figure, this is a product of the 19th century. As an icon of modern Christmas in his modern Americanized, merged with Santa Claus form, He had only been around for about 60 years by the time The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is published. Indeed, even the oldest versions of Father Christmas only date back to the mid-17th century, to the aftermath of the English Civil War, when royalist holdouts would use images of old Father Christmas to criticize the Puritan government which had outlawed Christmas, considering it a papist Catholic holiday. So Father Christmas is out of step with the rest of Narnia by a Wow, bare minimum of 500 years if we're looking back to the chivalric medieval fantasy setting, or by a minimum of 1500 years if we're looking at Greco-Roman classicalism. And that's without even getting into, that is without even opening the mystery box labeled, what does Christmas mean in Narnia, a land without Christ? It's bewildering. At least if we try to make sense of it in a fantasy novel, world-building, secondary creation kind of way. Looking at the narrative, though, you can see two consequences of Father Christmas's appearance. The first, obviously, are the gifts. The second is the chance to explore the children's reaction to being in the presence of a figure of what? (laughs) Sacred significance? Holy significance? Mythic significance? Again, that depends on what your exact interpretation of Father Christmas is. We might speculate that to Lewis, as to many Christians of the period, Father Christmas is coextensive to some extent with the historical figure of St. Nicholas and is thus a connection between modern commercial Christmas, modern and commercial there, parenthetically attributed to the 1950s, not the kind of modern commercialism we see today, and the quote-unquote true meaning of Christmas. There's also an interesting theory that I read. It's attributed in my reading, in fact, to Lewis scholar Michael Ward. I have not read his original text on this subject yet, but I will. Michael Ward asserts that Lewis is using Father Christmas as a spirit of the season because Aslan is the son and the emperor across the sea is the father and so we might need some kind of spirit to round out some kind of trinity. I can see the appeal of that theory. It's not completely convincing and it's not completely elegant, but 
it is at least an interesting proposal. I will read the ward and get back to you if there's significance there. It is perhaps the beat at the end of the last passage which is the most important, and it is echoed when Peter regards his own present from Father Christmas, his sword and his shield. Quote, Peter was silent and solemn as he received these gifts, for he felt they were a very serious kind of present. This is a very mature and a very adult kind of perspective on joy and happiness. A child's joy, a child's happiness, can be a simple source of and reaction to pleasure, to sweets, to Turkish delight, even if you are so inclined. But adult pleasure is always more measured. Adult joy is always bittersweet, because as adults, we have accumulated that knowledge of temporality. We know that this too shall pass, and that is a source of solace in the bad times, and it is a source of of bittersweetness in the good times. Even as we are celebrating, we know that this moment will not last. We will celebrate Christmas. Yes, we will celebrate Hogmanay. We will celebrate New Year's Eve. We will raise a glass and we will raise our spirits. But on Monday, we're going to be back at work. And on Wednesday, we have to take the car in for its inspection. And on Friday, the rent has to be paid. And this is, in part, what adult life is. It is not to say that the joys are diminished. It is not to say that the joys are less than they would otherwise be, that they are less pure or powerful than those of a child. They become more precious because of their fragility. They become more precious because we know that they will not endure. That solemnity that comes over the children as they apprehend the true magnitude, the true magnificence of Father Christmas in Narnia, as I said, unmediated by the filter between whatever dimensional wall exists between his true nature and the reflections that we get in our real world. Their response to this is adult. They are awestruck and joyous. But those two things yield a complicated emotional response that is more valuable than the simplified emotional response that we would expect from Lucy, perhaps, just unmediated. That complexity does point us toward a recurring beat in Lewis's storytelling. We have seen how both Susan and Mrs. Beaver will point us toward complexity. They will challenge assertions and decisions made on principle and introduce instead the nuance of all experience. We see that, in fact, at the end of this section. Quote, Peter had just drawn his sword out of its sheath and was showing it to Mr. Beaver when Mrs. Beaver said, Now then, now then, don't stand there talking till the tea's got cold. Just like men. Come and help to carry the tray down and we'll have breakfast. What a mercy I thought of bringing the bread knife. Again, we see not just domesticity, but complexity. This does seem to be the preserve of the female characters within the scope of the story. And that, I am afraid, must take us to, well, a premature ending among premature endings. I think that wrapping here at the end of chapter 10 is the wisest choice and leaves us in perhaps the best place to move into a more purposeful examination of the end of the story next week. I apologize that this is taking much longer than I thought it would. This is a learning exercise, you guys, here as we begin the Stars and Swords podcast to determine how much material we can meaningfully cover and how long my voice can hold out without rest or respite. Next week, for Christmas Eve, appropriately enough, well, we're going to try to look at the rest of the book, chapters 11 to 17 inclusive. That's about the same length, honestly, as the reading that we covered this week. So it is possible, but we may spill over just a little because the week after that, on New Year's Eve itself... I'm planning on releasing an episode of Wrap Up, perhaps one last chapter, perhaps two last chapters there, and the answers to any questions that you guys might have. So if there is something you would like me to discuss as I keep you company, either during your preparations for Christmas or for Hogmanay, or in the morning after, the night before, then please get in touch. You can email starsandswordspod at gmail.com. You can find me on Instagram, starsandswordspod there. Or better yet, come and join the Discord where I hang out most of the time, honestly, when I'm not recording a podcast, and where you will get to chat with the other supporters of Stars and Swords and the Next Word Podcast Network. Visit patreon.com slash next word to pledge your support, to get access to bonus episodes, to vote crucially on the next book that we discuss next week. The vote will be going up. I will present, I think, four books for a shortlist that you guys will be able to choose between. So come pledge your support and help me to fill your phone or device of choice with smart and ad-free podcasts. Oh, actually, one last incitement to support us on Patreon. Before the end of this month, not only am I going to release a bonus episode on the 2005 movie adaptation of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but along with the brilliant Elizabeth Ray, I am also going to be releasing a bonus episode for the Last Star in Hollywood podcast podcast 
about Kevin Reynolds' seminal 1991 movie, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. And I think that if you are a Narnia fan, then I think you are probably also a Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves fan. I think that that Venn diagram is a circle. I'm not sure, but I think that it is. So head on over, patreon.com slash next word. And because this podcast is just getting started, I would also love it if you could take a moment to leave a rating, a review on your podcast app or service of choice, Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever you listen, it means a lot and really helps to spread the word and make this more sustainable. That, finally, is going to do it for this week. I will be back next week to finish up, he said optimistically, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Until then, thank you for coming with me on this journey. And so, for a time, it looked as if all the adventures were coming to an end. But that was not to be. Thanks for listening.